Okay, so today is the session that I inserted into the syllabus and it required me to jiggle around a whole bunch of things. Uh, but I thought this stuff was too interesting and too important just to slide over it. So we have today a session which I called uh, um, literally, ooh, that's bad, Dissidents in the Desert. So here we have a bunch of stories, and I've given you on the syllabus uh, and on the handout the list of the stories. This is just about the entire inventory. I might have skipped one or two, like one or two sentences, little things that float by in the biblical narrative. But so all the big stories of Israelites in the desert causing trouble, raising a ruckus, or we might say grumbling. <laughs> right, grumbling. That's what's going on in, uh, for today. So uh, just make sure we are we know where we are in the narrative before we look at these stories. So we have the Israelites leave Egypt, right? The Song of the Sea, Exodus chapter 15. We have them immediately go off into the desert, Exodus 16. That's our first grumbling story right there. Exodus 16, Exodus 17, right? We'll come back to that, the, grum, the first grumbling story. Moses, we have nothing to eat. Moses, we're thirsty. There's no water. Moses, it was not much nicer in Egypt. Right, that's chapter 16 and chapter, paraphrasing, chapter 16 and chapter 17. Already we're in, uh, right. Then, this is, after that's gotten out of the way, we resume our grand narrative of marching through the desert, and we come to the foot of Mount Sinai, sometimes called Mount Chorev, right? And there we have the dramatic scene of the Israelites receiving the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words, the Decalogue, right? That, that occurs in chapter 19, sets you up for that, Chapter 20 is the revelation at Mount Sinai. That is followed immediately by the covenant code. <clears throat> Remember covenant code? What's the covenant code? Best of civil laws. All right, I'll take it, right? It's, uh, it seems to be a self-contained collection of laws that appears right after the Ten Commandments are over, right? And before the narrative resumes, we have there a, a, a piece of laws which we, some of which are we would call criminal law, some of which we would call civil law, so a little bit in there we would call it ritual law, right? And this is the uh, self-contained code, code of law, which has all kinds of connections with Near Eastern law. Okay, that's called the Covenant Code. Exodus chapters, what, 21 to 23, is that right? Give or take a, give or take a chapter in either direction. Okay, then the narrative resumes, and we have, then we go look at the handout, at this point, we start to get a little confused. Where exactly is Moses? Is Moses up on top of Mount Sinai with God, communing with God, or is Moses down below with Egypt? We have repeated instructions from God to Moses. Moses, go up. Moses, go down. Right. Uh, it's really very confusing. Uh, and the narrative now is getting a little bumpy. I'm not sure where we are anymore in the narrative. So Moses is somewhere either on top of Mount Sinai, communing with God, or Moses is down below giving instructions to the to the Israelites. So in 24, verses 12 through 18, God gives instructions to Moses to go up to Mount Sinai. Not clear if that's the same time as he went up earlier, or that's yet another time. Okay, I'm a little confused, but that's where we, Moses is. Chapter 25 to 31 is a long insertion in which God instructs Moses to build the tabernacle, which is a portable tent shrine, We'll talk about that more when we discuss P next week. Uh, a portable tent shrine, which is going to travel with the Israelites in the wilderness. Uh, instructions how to build it, uh, all the official vestments of the priests, of the high priests, uh, instructions how to put the thing together. That's what we have in this insertion in 2531. Second person masculine verb. You shall this. You shall make this. You shall make that. You shall make this. You shall make that. You being apparently Moses. Where is Moses at the time when he gets these instructions of these long chapters? Presumably he's up on Mount Sinai with God. That's where we left him. So presumably this insertion is an insertion of somebody wants you to make clear that the instructions to build the tabernacle come directly from God to Moses while Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai. Even though the text does not say what I just said. But that seems, or I'm tempted to say, surely that's implied by the way the chapters are arranged. So, we get to the last verse of chapter 31. God gives Moses the two tablets of testimony, 
which seems to be another name for the Decalogue, and everybody knows what they look like, right? We've all seen pictures of the Ten Commandments, right? So the two tablets, and Moses is ready to come down. That's when all of a sudden, chapter 32, we have the story of the golden calf, about which more are not. The golden calf story, in which the Israelites once again take grumbling to a new level. <coughs> Right, in which they rebel, actually flat out rebellion against God. This is not just grumbling anymore. This is we're out of here. Right. So that's the that's the golden calf story. Moses descends from Mount Sinai now, carrying with him the genuine tablets written by the hand of God or the finger of God. He sees the Israelites uh, cavorting and doing all sorts of improper things, uh, perhaps resembling a uh, undergraduate drinking party. Right? The Israelites are all rolling around in a proper, uh, well, whatever. You understand. Right? So Moses is angry and throws the tablets onto the ground, smashing them. And then the story has to proceed after everybody calms down. Moses has to write the new set of tablets, which is what happens in, in the story. We'll come back to that. <coughs> what happens after that, chapter 34? Also in chapter 35, now Moses builds the tabernacle. Now, I'm really confused. I lost track of where we were. And then the narrator, for some reason, has repeats almost verbatim all those instructions that Moses had gotten. You shall make this, you shall make that. Now it says, and Moses made this, and Moses made that. And it repeats everything verbatim. Had Moses had asked me for editorial advice, I would have suggested to him, Moses, you could probably skimp on these chapters because you already told everybody in detail before now you all you have to do is say, and Moses did as God <coughs> instructed him. That's all. But no one asked my opinion. So what can I do? So there are chapter 35 to 40, which Moses now builds the tabernacle, or perhaps with the Salel, this artisan craftsman working with him, build it, right? And then the book of Exodus comes to an end. And now I'm thoroughly confused where I am in the storyline, and it gets worse because the book of Leviticus has no storyline at all. And the book of Numbers, we don't get a storyline, we get bits and pieces of a story. And one tempted to say is the storyline is lost. There is no storyline. The storyline more or less resumes in the book of Joshua. I get episodes here in the book of Numbers. No epi- virtually no episodes in Leviticus. I can think of two episodes, but virtually nothing happens in the book of Leviticus. Almost nothing happens. In the book of Numbers, we get little bits and pieces. Now, the kind of story that the book of Numbers likes most of all are grumbling stories. There's one story after another in the book of Numbers, how the Israelites grumble, rebel, revolt, turn back, <coughs> want to turn back, turn their back on Moses, etc., uh, etc. Et that seems to be a favorite uh, story. So if, if you're a little unclear where we are in the storyline, the answer is you're right. It's a little unclear where we are in the storyline. So that's the background where we are, and among those stories that we find, these self-contained episodes are grumbling rebellion stories. That's what we're talking about today. Okay, let's look at these stories. So, first big point. The experience of the Israelites in the wilderness. In the Hebrew Bible, there is a tradition that this is honeymoon. God and Israel have just sealed the knot. They signed a covenant which is like a marriage contract, and the marriage metaphor does emerge among the prophets. So this is when they're in full bloom of youth and love, as they wander off to their honeymoon suite, right uh, there in the desert, to consummate their relationship. That's one way to look at it. And I gave you two famous passages in the book of Jeremiah where he, he does that. When Jeremiah says, people of Israel, come with me again back to the wilderness the way it once was. But of course, the tradition that we have in the Torah is not that one. What do you mean, come back to the wilderness? It was terrible. Every few chapters, more Israelites are getting killed for rebelling and grumbling. Why should I want to go back to the wilderness? So Jeremiah, you either have a different version of the Torah in your book, or it's very selective reading. But this is a different tradition. The tradition that we have is that the time of the Israelites wandering in the wilderness is a time of constant, almost uninterrupted trouble. Tension, rebellion, grumbling. In the Jeremianic tradition, I don't know where that comes from, but it doesn't come from our book of Numbers, I'll tell you that. 
So, we have these grumbling stories. What happens in the grumbling stories? Three basic patterns. <coughs> A. Moses, we have no food. We have no water. The food tastes <coughs> terrible. We had such good food back in Egypt, it was wonderful. That's pattern A. Right. Pattern B. Moses, who the hell are you to tell me what to do? Who put you in charge? Who made, who made you, in, and worse yet, who made Aaron in charge? Right. Aaron is the, the high priest. So uh, who the hell are you, Moses and Aaron, that you're bossing us around telling us what to do? That's pattern B. Or pattern C, we don't have so much grumbling as the Israelites run off and do something terrible, something, quote, sinful. That's the Baal Peor story in Numbers 25, or the Golden Calf story, which we'll talk about in a moment, and or they lose trust in God. In the spy story, they hear the re- report from the spies, and all of them say, it's over, we're, we're doomed. <coughs> These are three, three basic patterns, and then what happens? So we have this grumbling, this rebellion, this rejection of God, and then we have a common outcome. God blows up. God loses his temper. God loses his cool. Remember, this is an anthropopathic God. This is a God with anthropopathic human feelings, human emotions, right? God gets happy, God gets sad, God gets angry, God can cry, I mean, God can laugh, right? God has human emotions, so God blows up. Typically what happens too, there's a kind of plague or a mysterious fire or something happens and wipes out at least some or all of the malefactors uh, who are involved in this. And then finally God solves the problem. We're thirsty? Okay, here's some water. We're hungry? Fine, here's some food. Just leave me alone. I- I hated that part. Uh, You know, uh, which God, you know, solved the problem. We're hungry? Okay, here's food. When God gets angry in these stories, the typical reaction is God says to Moses, Moses, stand aside, I'm going to nuke them. You know, drop one bomb, take, take them all out, and I'll start over again with you. And Moses says in reply, no, no, God, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. And Moses has a favorite argument. What will the Egyptians say? In other words, God, it looks terrible. I mean, it really looks bad. You will not be able to play the, put this down, right? You've got to, you can't do that. Terrible for your reputation. And God typically says, well, all right. Okay, then, I won't wipe them all out. But instead, I'm going to punish them. Right. This is a typical pattern in these stories. And this, uh, this motif, by the way, that God, you can't do what you're planning to do because if you do, you'll ruin your reputation. You'll be shamed in front of other nations when they hear about what you've done. That argument, we'll see, recurs regularly in the Psalms and occurs occasionally in the Prophets. <coughs> Some ancient Israelites thought this was a very powerful argument, that God, for his own reputation, cannot punish the Israelites in the way that he wants to. Because if he does, he'll be seen as a failure. A very interesting idea. Well, that's part of Moses' argument. God, you can't do it. You promised the ancestors. That's part of it also. You promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, you know, we've got a, we got a deal. But of course, God can say in reply, no, you got a deal, but you promised to be good boys and girls, and look how you're doing, look what you're doing. So this deal thing works both ways. I'm coming to that. Many of these stories contain the miraculous. Um, I'm not sure how to explain it, why these miracles seem to cluster in these stories, but they do. So the very, very, very first one, Exodus 16, 17, right? Hey, we have no, we have no water. We have no food. So God brings down the manna, this very mysterious bread from heaven in Exodus chapter 17 with a parallel in the book of Numbers. <laughs> or we're thirsty. Okay, Moses, take your staff and hit the rock and the water will come out of the rock. Mysterious plagues, mysterious pillars of fire, this mysteri- ever mysterious bronze serpent to put an end to this plague of serpents. I don't know what's going on there, but it sure is intriguing. 
uh, earth swallows up datan and aviram, everybody's favorite moment, right, where the earth opens its mouth, literally, that's what it says, the earth opens her mouth and swallows them up, like we would say an earthquake. Except it was a targeted earthquake. <coughs> and the sprouting of the staffs, that all the tribal chieftains put their staffs in this tabernacle, they come back the next day and they've all sprouted. Sorry, Aaron's staff has sprouted, excuse me. So the miraculous it seems to be a regular motif in these stories, again, making clear who's right and who's wrong, right, who's behaved correctly, who's behaved incorrectly, who's legit, who's authentic, who's not. That seems to be a prominent motif in these stories. Last but not least, many of these stories are complex assemblages of material. They're not straightforward, simple stories. Almost all of these are complicated combinations of things, if you trust modern Bible scholars. So, the manna story, I didn't put that in the handout, but the manna story in Exodus 17 is a combination of two stories. There's quail, we're hungry, nothing to eat. Okay, how do you feed them? Either God sends manna, this mysterious food from heaven, or quail mysteriously show up and the Israelites eat them. And then God, of course, shrines them and kills them because he can't deal with them. Okay, that's, uh, that's a combination of things. Plus, Exodus 17 throws in Sabbath law. Really complicated story with what's going on in Exodus 17. Then we have doublets. Exodus 17 and Numbers 20. Kugel talks about this. We seem to have the same story twice. God told Moses, they're hungry, they're thirsty. Okay, Moses, take your staff and strike the rock. Moses strikes rock. Water emerges. Children of Israel drink water. Everyone is happy. Right, that's the story. Except the second time around, Moses says, talk to the rock. But Moses forgot, having remembered the earlier chapter, right, Moses strikes the rock. And God says, I didn't tell you to do that. And he blows up at Moses. So, okay, anyway, it seems to be the same, two versions of the same story. Everybody's favorite example, the rebellion of Korah in the book of Numbers. So Korah is a Levite. So it seems to have a, a Levite's uh, gripes against Aaron. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Levite's gripes against Aaron. We also have Datan and Aviram. Who are they? I don't know. But they're from the tribe of Reuben. They have other gripes. And the gripes of Datan and Aviram and their 250 followers and the gripes of Korah are blended together into an almost seamless story, except that if you read it very carefully, it's very clear. The earth swallows up Datan and Aviram and Korah seems to die in a mysterious fire. But modern Bible scholars are very good at detecting seams in the narrative. Last, the spy story. Who is the hero of the spy story? Who is the one spy who comes back and says, Don't listen to them! We can trust in the Lord and we can conquer them. Have no fear! Forward! Who says that? The other spies will say, No, we're doomed, we're doomed, we're doomed. And the spy says, No, trust in the Lord and we will triumph. Who is that? So it's either Caleb, or in Hebrew, Kalev, Caleb, or some later narrator didn't like that because after all, it's Joshua who's going to lead the Israelites into the land of Israel, so he's stuck in Joshua. So it's Caleb and Joshua. Again, very bumpy. So I don't know how to explain this either, why these stories are not simple stories, these are complicated combinations of things that are put together in such a way that we, ever skillful modern Bible scholars, and then take them apart. <clears throat> okay, that's those are the big themes. Exciting stuff. So now the big question. And I thought Kogel would talk about this big question, but he doesn't, or if he does, I missed it completely. Why does the Torah have such stories? This is not just one isolated story here. We've got a, a bunch of stories, and some of these stories are, ma- are real stories, episodes, not just two or three lines. The whole chapter is worth of material, and sometimes more. Why does the Torah have such stories? What's the meaning of such stories? Again, I'm not asking whether the stories are true or not. For the 99th time, that's the wrong question to ask. The question to ask is, what do the stories mean? So here are, my, here are my guesses. I'm happy to hear your suggestions, or when you read them, you'll get your own ideas to understand what, what's the point, and why do we have these stories. 
So it emphasizes divine power. Here we see that uh, motif of the Old Testament God of justice. You know, bam, bam, bam. You know, the, the shooting with you know six shooters or would drop an atom bomb. You know, the angry God of the of the of the Old Testament, as Christians would say. Okay, yeah, we see that. So we learn not to mess around with this God. This God is a powerful God. Certainly true. This God, you know, does not brook rebellion easily or lightly. True. This God can get angry. True. But I would say no less important as a motif in these stories is God's mercy. The same God who blows up and at his people and wants to kill them is also the God who can forgive them. And that, I think, is no less a striking, a striking motif. Especially in the big stories, the, the golden calf story and the spy story, these are the quintessential moments where Moses is at his best. Where Moses is not just a leader, but Moses has the prophetic role of intercessor. He intercedes on behalf of the people of Israel with God. He turns to God and says, God, you can't do that. You can't kill them off. You have to have mercy. And indeed, these scenes uh, in Exodus and Numbers uh, become, at least in later rabbinic readers, these become the quintessential phraseology which we use all to this day in the rabbinic prayer book when we're trying to invoke divine mercy and forgiveness. We're quoting Moses. So the, what's remembered of the story, at least in later rabbinic reading, is the power of divine mercy. No matter how far go- gone you might be, there is still the potential for divine mercy. Now, that, I see that motif in these stories also. How to play that off against the uh, powerful, just, uh, vindictive God? Well, okay, we have a tension here. These are both aspects of the divine. It would be a mistake to focus on the one and to ignore the other. Then we come back to this mysterious covenant thing that uh, Rachel uh, had reminded us about. The covenant, remember, is the link between God and Israel. But this is not a natural link, I use the phrase I like to use, it's not natural, it's constructed. Right? It doesn't just come with the territory. It's not like just a tree grows out of the ground and there it is. No, it's a negotiated relationship, in which both parties enter into this relationship, each one having chosen the other. And that's how the text depicts it. So what we see in these stories is there is a risk of this link being broken. There is a risk that one party can say, I'm out of here. Enough. Or from the Israelite point of view, the risk is we fear there's a risk that God will (coughs) rip up the covenant and then will be abandoned. And indeed, in later Jewish, sorry, later biblical literature, and then in later Jewish literature, we indeed have such conscious reflections, especially in and around a disaster which has happened, in which we say, "God, how could you allow this to have happened? How could this have befallen us? Have you abandoned us? Have you rejected us? Are we not your people?" This will become a very powerful motif in later reflection. Uh, precisely because there's always the fear in a covenantal relationship, is this really permanent? So, if I read this correctly, what these stories might be saying is, you is the one that's got to behave yourselves. God can reject his people. He doesn't, because he's merciful. But he could. And you have to behave yourself. You have to be mindful of what God wants. So the chosen people motif does not mean that people of Israel are immune to divine punishment. It means the opposite. Chosen people motif means that the Israelites get special attention from God for their infractions.
Well, that's the best I can do with this motif. A few broad ideas of how you understand what we're supposed to take away from these numerous stories. Um, I'd be happy to hear it. In any case, what's remarkable is that the stories do not remember the Israelites marching through the Red Sea and then marching straight through to the land of Canaan, head held high, full of confidence and trust in the Lord. The opposite is the story. It's just completely the opposite. We'll, we'll come back to the uh, truth question, namely, did the Israelites, were there 600, 3,500 adult Israelite males, not to mention women, children, hangers-on, and cattle, and such, did they you know, march their way across the desert in Sinai and then come and come across the Jordan and conquer the city of Jericho? <coughs> Do we believe that as a story, as, sorry, as history? Answer, I'm not going to answer that now, but we'll come back to that in a couple weeks. Okay, we'll, we'll, discuss, we'll, we'll discuss that. Right now, I'm just trying to understand what the stories mean, right? What, what truths, in the eyes of the storyteller, the stories are trying to impart. Now, as far as place names, I don't know where the chicken or the egg is on this one. Do we have a list of place names, and then later Israelites invented all kinds of stories so as to justify and explain the place names? Or are the place names cleverly invented as after these stories are up? to sort of represent, tell you what the stories represent or what the stories signify. I don't know. But many of these stories are, in fact, are associated with place names that are apparently bear some import related to the story. Last point, some of these stories are more clearly focused on, on specific points. So, why Moses did not enter the land of Canaan? That's the answer. How come Moses didn't make it? He came to the border of the land of Canaan, and the God said, okay, it's enough. Now it's time to die. <laughs> Why did Moses make it? Yes? He struck the rock. He struck the rock instead of speaking to it. Instead, instead of speaking to it. Now you might say in reply, gee, that's not, uh, gee, that's not so terrible, is it? I mean, you know, all right, so he forgot to you. Remember the chapter from Exodus instead of the chapter from Numbers, and he got confused. God, is that reason enough? All right, don't ask me. Ask them what it says. So I was explaining this mystery why Moses led them out of Egypt but could not quite make it into the Promised Land. Why did the Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years? So why did it take 40 years? Because God wanted all the original uh, people who exited from Egypt to die. Why do they want them all to die? Forty years, a generation to go by, so that their children would inherit the land of Israel, not them. Why not? Because God's angry at them. Why? They grumbled a lot. Yeah, exactly. God was sick and tired of all their grumbling, especially the spy story. When the spies come back with bad news, <coughs> these cities are, you won't believe, and these people are like giants, and the walls are thick like this, and there's not a chance in hell we'll be able to conquer them. Right, and the Israelites go off in their tents and all start crying and say, oh, it's all over, we're done for, let's go back to Egypt, we'll never succeed. And God says, that's it, I've had enough. Okay, that's it, you're not going to conquer the land then. That's what you feel, then fine, don't do it. You die in the desert, your children will inherit. That's the story. But wandering around 40 years in the desert, and there's not a kiosk in sight, how do they support, how do they support themselves? Answer, well, the story explains over and over again where they got water from, where they got food. Uh, you know, that's part of the story. It's explaining this mystery. How do you have 603,500 adult Israelite <coughs> males with women, children, and attendants, hangers on, and, and flocks, and somehow they don't all starve to death or drop dead of thirst? So the stories explain that. So I understand that's part of the function of the story. Okay, let's talk about the golden calf story, which is, as I said, uh, by far the most important of these stories, important in the sense of the uh, impact it has on later readers. What's going on in the golden calf story? So you recall Moses is up on top of Mount Sinai, <coughs> Moses is up for 40 days and 40 nights, although I'm not sure that's this period of 40 days and 40 nights or some other period, it's confusing, but the chronology is mixed up. Anyway, he's up there on Mount Sinai, uh, on the top of Mount Sinai, <coughs> and it says that in we got to turn to uh, uh, chapter 31, uh, chapter 32, and the Israelites say, I don't know what happened to Moses, but he seems not to be coming back. 
So what should we do? And some bright person says, I know, let's make a golden calf. And everybody says, great idea. Aaron, you make us a golden calf. Aaron, brother of Moses. Right, you would think Aaron would do better. But Aaron says, okay. Okay. Right? I'm paraphrasing here again, right? Uh, they make a golden calf, and they start then uh, dancing lewdly, is what's suggested in the text, and presumably that leads to where the usual results of such activity, right, uh, around the golden calf. And until, of course, Moses comes down, picks the next moment to come down the next day, you know, one day late, one day, one day, that's all it took. Moses is a day late, that's how the rabbis do the chronology. He spent one more day, the Israelites miscounted, 40 days and 40 nights. They couldn't wait anymore. So Moses comes down the next day and his sidekick Joshua says, Moses, I think there's noise in the camp. And Moses says, you know, Charlton Heston, this is not the sound, well, whatever, anyway. So uh, uh, you should watch the movie, right? He comes down, he sees what's going on, he sees the golden calf, he sees the people corrupt, or the morals corrupted, right? And he hurls the Ten Commandments onto the ground, which means what class? It's the same thing as saying, see your covenant? <coughs> I've torn it up. It's over. It's completely null and void. Then we have a scene, a very complicated series of scenes where the malefactors get killed off. Who comes to Moses' aid? The Levites come to Moses' aid to act as a sort of police force. Right to come kill off all the malefactors, uh, and then there's something mysterious going on. Then the story gets a little fuzzy, but then it ends with the, the climax of that story is Moses importunes God. Most God wants to kill them all. Start over again. Moses importunes God. There's a very mysterious and very touching scene of Moses uh, with a revelation of God, of God's revealing part of Himself. Very mysterious chapter. Right to Moses. Moses prays, God forgives, and then Moses gets more instructions from God, which may or may not be a different version of the Ten Commandments. And Moses goes back up to the mountain. That's the story of the golden calf. So, what's going on in this story? So the story as we have it is a polemic against the shrines built by Jeroboam. Who is Jeroboam? Don't tell me Jeroboam was a large <laughs> bottle of wine. Giggle, that's a flat joke class. But the Jeroboam is a large bottle of wine. All right. If you don't know what I mean, just look it up, Google it, Jeroboam, you'll see. So who is Jeroboam? Or in Hebrew, Yerab'am. Who is Jeroboam? Write that down in the IDs. They should know Jeroboam. Okay, <laughs> right. Uh, Jeroboam is the uh, <clears throat> king who broke away after the death of Solomon. The kingdom splits, if you recall. Go back to your biblical timeline. It's a very helpful timeline prepared by B. Right? Go back to the timeline. Solomon dies. We'll talk about this in a couple weeks. We'll get to the narrative. We'll, uh, we'll get to that point. Um, he dies, and then there's a secession of the northern tribes from the southern tribes. And we have this split. The div- united monarchy becomes a divided monarchy. Ephraim and Manasseh in the north, and Judah in the south. A couple more tribes here, a couple more tribes there, but the main tribes are Ephraim and Manasseh in the north, and the tribe of Judah in the south. Jeroboam is that no good rebel, Johnny Reb, uh, turncoat, right, who leads the rebellion of the northern tribes against the south. Is Jeroboam a good guy, class? No. I'm just referring to what it says in the perspective of the Book of Kings. Right? The real story is more, far more complicated. The right? Book of Kings presents it as simply, they have a grievance, it's true, but that grievance does not justify what they did. So the Northern Kingdom begins as an act of rebellion, and Jeroboam is the rebel. Now Jeroboam, knowing that the Israelites revere and respect the temple that had been built by David and Solomon, I'm not sure I believe that either, but that's what it says in the Book of Kings, so Jeroboam says, gee, I've got to make sure they don't go on pilgrimage to the temple. You know, then they'll rebel against me. They'll go back to the house of David. I need to find a way to seal, to cement their loyalty to the northern kingdom and not to the south. So what broad idea did he have? I know. I'll build a shrine. Special shrines are my borders. One in the southern border, one in my northern border. 
and the Israelites who want to go to a, tem tri a, te a temple, well, they'll go right here. They don't have to go to my enemies down south. They can go right here. So he builds one in Bethel. He builds one in Dan. Bethel in the south, Dan in the north. And what do you think he puts into his shrines? What does he put into his shrines? Matt, what does he put into his shrines? Golden calf. Golden calf. <clears throat> hmm. Now, <clears throat> in the eyes of the author of Book of Kings, that is the great, that plus his rebellion against Solomon, but that act is the great sin of Jeroboam. Because it's no longer just a rebellion against the house of Judah, it's a rebellion against God. With the act of building the golden calf, it's understood to be idolatry. Right? Worship of false gods via images. Now, it's very likely that Jeroboam was not worshipping false gods with this golden calf. He thought he was worshipping the God who took the Israelites out of Egypt. In fact, that's the phrase that's used, the identical phrase in the book of Kings and the book of Exodus. When the Israelites build the golden calf, they say, these, well, either this is or these are your God or gods who took you out of the land of Egypt. They're not worshipping some other god. They're worshipping that god, except they're doing so through images. The narrator, both in the book of Exodus and the book of Kings, forgets this subtle but extremely important distinction and sees the worship of any image as ipso facto the worship of a god other than the true god. So when they say, these are your gods, or this is your god who took you out of the land of Egypt, from the point of view of the narrator, that is false. Because no god who is a golden calf took anybody out of anywhere. This is an act of rebellion against God. So many modern Bible scholars have suggested that the story in the golden calf, in the book of Exodus, lurking beneath it, was once upon a time an original story authenticating the golden calf. Look, Jeroboam says, we Israelites have been building golden calves for a long time. Why it goes back to the Israelites in the desert? This is a perfectly licit way to worship the God who took us out of the land of Egypt. And that story is then turned upside down on its head, where it is now taken to be an act of rebellion. Okay, I'm not sure I believe what I just said, but that's, that's what modern Bible scholars <coughs> argue. Uh, and indeed, it is a strange story. But here's the bottom line. Surely we're meant to understand that the golden calf in the desert is as illegitimate as the golden calves erected by Jeroboam. And in fact, the one clearly shows that the other, that both are sinful, acts of rebellion, um, inauthentic, illegitimate, stay away. Look at the story in the Book of Kings. You haven't done it yet, but you will in the notes in the JSB. The story as we have it is a polemic against Aaron and in favor of the Levites. Aaron builds the golden calf. Bad, bad. The Levites help Moses restore order. Good, good. Now, what's the relationship between Aaron and the Levites? Well, it's, it's complicated. All right, they're all from the same tribe, the tribe of Levi. Right? Remember the sons, Reuben, <coughs> Simeon, Levi, the third one. So Le the third son, Levi. So if Aaron is from the house of Levi, if you are descendant from Aaron, then you wind up being a priest or a Cohen. <coughs> Moi. If you are not from the house of Aaron, but you're from the other lines in the tribe of Levi, you turn out to be a Levite. To be very blunt, ladies and gentlemen, what is a Levite? A Levite is a second class priest. A bottle washer. The priest gets all the glory out in front, and the Levite just gets his hands dirty and carrying stuff and cleaning up. How that came about is a very interesting question, which is not I cannot possibly begin to discuss now, basically because I don't know the answer, and also because the theories on this point are right all over the place. There's something odd. So anyway, Aaron 
In this story, is t- this story seems to be told by a supporter of Levites. Levites support Moses. Aaron builds the golden calf. This is the opposite to the Korach story, where in the Korach story, Korach is a Levite rebelling against Aaron, right? And that story very clearly says Korach, Aaron. So that's the opposite, the mirror image story. So these stories testify to inner struggles within the priestly strata, within the hieratic strata, right? The group that's, that services the Lord in the holy sites. There's this fight. There's an out, out fight going on. Okay. The story raises an interesting question of where the divine presence is. This is going to be rather complicated. I'll come back to this when I discuss P. The important point here is that according to the story as we have it, Moses is so fed up with the people, so angry at them, that he takes the tabernacle or the tent of meeting, moves it outside of the camp, moves it from the inside the camp to outside the camp. In other words, God's presence should be inside the camp with the people. That's P. According to P, the Israelites will build a tabernacle, a portable tent shrine, and it's located smack dab in the middle of the camp. And therefore, as punishment, the divine presence is removed from inside to outside. But there's another voice in the Hebrew Bible, in the Torah, which says outside is the appropriate place for it. Because you don't want the divine presence to be inside the camp where people live, die, have sex, have babies, have skin eruptions, and all kinds of yucky things happen. You want God out there where it's safer. <coughs> Two perspectives. This story sees the perspective that God's presence belongs in the camp, and outside the camp is a sign of the diminishment, the diminution of divine contact with his people. And that's what happens in this story. God, Moses takes the tent, moves it outside the border. There's a very important note there in the JSB. I'll explain what I, explain what I just said. Last but not least, <clears throat> golden calf story will figure prominently in later Jewish-Christian debate. When Moses smashes the tablets, is this another way of saying that the old covenant is gone? If you are a Christian reader, you will look at the golden calf story and you, will, and you will say, see, this proves that the covenant of the law is broken. This is not the true covenant that God wants. And if you are a Jewish reader, you'll have to say, yeah, yeah, that's true, but, but, uh, uh, but he put it back together again, right, didn't we? We got a second set of covenant, the second tablets, and they're just as good. Okay, that in summary will summarize uh, much Jewish-Christian debate, which the golden calf story will loom large in Jewish-Christian uh, debate. Horn the Moses, ready at Moses. Okay, that's a note in the JSB, right? The famous story of Michelangelo with the Moses and the horns. Look at the note in the JSB to explain that. Okay, now I only have like one minute left to discuss the Balaam story. The Balaam story is here only by association. Numbers 25 is a grumbling story. Right? The story of the Israelites go a whoring after the daughters of the um, uh, Midianites, or is it the Moabites? I forget for a second. Moab. Right? Don't Moab. Moabites. <clears throat> and they go a whoring both literally and metaphorically. Literally, they go a whoring with the daughters of the Moabites. Uh, and metaphorically, because that means also the turning against God. So the rebellion against God. So the story as we have it is juxtaposed to this, this mysterious seer, magic man, seer, prophet, Balaam, or Bilam in Hebrew, or Balaam uh, in English, famous for his talking donkey. So there are numerous complicated traditions about this, but later on in chapter 31, we understand that Bilam is the one who came up with this devious plan to get the Israelites to go a whoring and a sinning with Baal Peor, and the daughters of Moab, so as to ignite the wrath of their god against them. Isn't this clever? Right? You, you can't beat them. We'll get their own god to destroy them, is Bilaam's plan. That's what's implied in chapter 31. The Bilaam story otherwise stands by itself as an extraordinarily intriguing little piece. It's the only non-Israelite prophet in the entire Hebrew Bible, uh, famous for its story of the talking donkey, which is just an amazing little piece where most scholars agree this is meant to be funny, it's meant to show him a buffoon story, it's meant to be comical, 
it's 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 meant to uh, lambast him, lampoon uh, this figure of, of Bilam, and yet the story is full of these extraordinary prophetic prophecies or songs about uh, Israel and God, some of which are still recited today in Jewish liturgy, notably Matovo Yaakov, how beautiful are your tents, O Jacob, is a quote from Bilam in this passage. And all scholars observe that Bilam seems to have been a well-known magic man seer in the ancient Near East because we have attestations of Bilam outside the Hebrew Bible. To put it together, it's an extraordinarily intriguing little a little piece, but my time really is up. So, thank you everyone. I'll see you Monday is a day off. Enjoy your vacation. I'll see you a week from today.